I most welcome you to today's episode of the Boca School of Government. This is our seventh edition of the Masterclass series, and this is our first for the new year. So before we start in earnest, let me take some time out to say a very happy new year to each and every one of us. We are thankful to God for life, and we are also hopeful uh, for the new year and for what the new year brings. As some of us may already know, Boca School of Government is is a school, a religious school, where we tend to draw out biblical concepts and our aim is to draw out biblical concepts and apply it to modern day or contemporary governance, political, governmental, and indeed societal systems. So that's what we are looking at uh, in Boca School of Government. So today our focus is a little bit broad. Uh, we're looking at the politics of philanthropy, especially in quote-unquote uh, developing countries. I believe that every country is still developing, but for semantics and nomenclature, they love to call uh, Africa and uh, some places developing countries. So uh, for that better lack of more generally accepted word, we are using the term developing countries. Uh, so let's start in earnest. Philanthropy, developing nations, politics. These things often get intertwined. And so while I'm not going to go into the textbook definition of philanthropy, I'm going to say that for developing nations, especially because, um, because they are developing, it is expected that a good number of the citizens are at a place where you could say that they are hungry. They are also at a place where several of their needs, their housing needs, their healthcare needs, their feeding needs and all of those needs are unmet. So when you have that place where you have a population, for instance, that they say that in Nigeria's population, that you have a good number of people living below poverty line. And you could say that that is um, a little bit that the population is as a place where you can try to exploit them with things like philanthropy. And that's not just in Nigeria, but in many developing nations or countries, let's use, let's use countries. And because of this, the way they recruit their leaders is to say, oh, this person gave me this, this person gave me that. And so politics or political decisions at that level where the citizens are vulnerable are in such a place where politicians can exploit the vulnerability of citizens to attempt to manipulate their political choices. In, for instance, the UK and in the United States or in all of those advanced countries, there's never been a time where you will give some people uh, two cups of rice and you expect them to give you their votes. That, that can happen because they are the place where, one, the level of education, and secondly, is that people are not so vulnerable that a cup of rice can compromise their voting decisions. People are not so vulnerable that paying for school fees can compromise their voting decisions. But make no mistake about this, and as we try to establish the baseline for this conversation, I'm going to be saying a lot of things that some of you might be hearing for the first time. One of it is the usual arguments you see in Nigeria every election, that civil society groups are, are, are fighting. Oh, let's stop vote buying, let's stop vote buying, let's stop vote buying, let's stop vote buying. And I think I understand what they are saying. But then if you look deeper into what they are saying, they actually, um, well, in my view, I would think that what they are saying does not necessarily stand side by side with reality. One is this, that votes, anywhere you see democracy, votes are bought. I'll say this again. There is vote buying in every democracy you see in the world. Whether you see democracy in America, you see democracy in Britain, you see democracy in anywhere, call it advanced, first world, second world, third world, once they are practicing democracy, all votes are bought. But the question now is, what is the currency for the exchange of votes? including those of you here who are listening to me. And you will say, oh, no, I don't sell my votes. Or oh, you sell your votes. You just don't know the currency with which you exchange your votes. Let me make this analogy. If you come to a typical village that people don't have so much enlightenment, people don't have so much their knowledge about the political actors, if you give them a bag of rice, you have compromised their votes. So at the exchange of a bag of rice, they can give you their votes. There are places... For mere 500 naira, they could give you their votes. There are others. All you need to do to convince them to give you their votes is to show them a manifesto. So to them, the currency for purchase of their votes is a credible manifesto. 
people like Godson, for instance, I know that before you vote a credible candidate, you want to watch the person's interview. And some of you, the only thing you need to do to get their votes is to speak well on an Arise TV interview or a Channel TV interview, and then you've bought their votes. There are some people, the currency for purchase of their votes is appeal to tribal sentiments. All you need to do is to chat a Milokon, and once you are you're a Milokon, you've bought their votes. Appeal to tribal sentiments. So anything you tell them, once you appeal to that, their base emotions, you've gotten their vote and their support, regardless of whatever your other credentials are. And there are some people, the only thing you need to do to get their votes, for instance in America, is to quote-unquote support their ideology. I saw a very recent video of America's president, Joe Biden. I think that video was in the, I can't remember what's here now, but that's a video that looks like, because he looks a little bit younger in that video. And he was riling against abortion. He was riling against same-sex marriage, not abortion, same-sex marriage in the video that I saw. And all of a sudden, because it is now untenable for him, because politicians in America, make no mistake about this, many of them don't have ideologies. What they do have is that they have opinion poll. So if they do an opinion poll and they see that the voters in their vicinity are pro-abortion, all of a sudden they switch from pro-life to pro-abortion. And if they see that more people are against gay marriage in that their locality, they will all of a sudden start championing anti-gay marriage. If the tide turns tomorrow and that they see that a good number of the voters now are for gay marriage, that's why you see people like Joe Biden change his ideas fundamentally on gay marriage. Not that his religion has changed, not that his core belief has changed, but because there are more voters who think like this, and then he wants to think like that or to pretend to be thinking like that or pursuing the ideas and the ideology. So for those people, the only currency you need to purchase their votes is to support their ideology, is to say, oh, I am pro-abortion. And then pro-abortion is to all of a sudden, regardless of what your other policies are, they are supporting you because you've bought their votes with what they wanted to hear. There are other people, all you need to say is, I am pro-life. And then all of a sudden, they start supporting you because just by telling them that anybody who commits abortion is a murderer, that's what they need to hear before they give you their votes. And that is the same way there are people who need to hear that I am a Christian, vote for Christian. That's it. That's what they need to hear. There are others who need to hear I am a Muslim, don't vote an infidel. That's all they need to hear, regardless of what other things you're doing. But there are some who are sophisticated that they may have to investigate your economic policies and you buy them over using economic policies. There are some people, their biases are with education policies. There are people, their biases are with the lifestyle of the individual. For instance, in 2015, a lot of people supported President Muhammad Buhari in Nigeria because of, quote unquote, his frugal lifestyle, this man of integrity. So because people were looking for a man of integrity who would become like a messiah, who was going to come and save them from the PDP misrule. So they, they narrated this narration of a messiah and that messiah appealed to some population but then there are others who see him as an ethnic champion as someone who will go to fight for their ethnic group who go to fight for their rights and for those people they also in that sense sold their votes to him using those things so what i've tried to paint to you now is that all votes are bought and that is why in places where you can appeal to base sentiments you see politicians appealing to base sentiments in places where they can do a miloko, you will see politicians do a miloko. In places where they cannot do that, they can try to buy the votes with bags of rice, nodules, um, cartons of nodules, tricycles, and every other thing that they call quote unquote empowerment. So the first point has been established that in every functional democracy, all votes are bought. The only differentiating line now is what is the currency. In developing countries, the currency could be outright exchange of naira and cobble. It could be bags of rice, it could be onions, it could be noodles, it could be anything. And then in places where people have not so advanced with education, you can buy their votes using appeal to ethnic sentiments or religious sentiments, or in some cases, a mixture of votes. I hope you know that there are some people who buy votes with appellation to age. There are some people who say, oh, it's youth's turn. It's time for youth to take over. So their manifesto is, it's time for the youth. If you ask them in the morning, they are doubling down, it's time for the youth. That is their manifesto. And there are some people who buy votes with other currencies. So it's been clearly established that world over votes are bought. The differentiating line now is currency. Having now established this point, 
let's come back to the original conversation, which is developing countries and the politics of philanthropy. Because many voters in, in developing countries are vulnerable, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. A lot of them don't know where, um, you know, that thing you say, don't buy votes, don't buy votes, take five thousand, don't do this, don't do this. They are not in a place where they can listen to you. They are not in a place simply where they can listen to you because some voters, especially in this place, are in a place where they are hard pressed that that 5,000 naira, 20,000 naira, whatever it is that the politician is offering will seem like a lot to them. It actually is a lot to them. And because of that, bags of fries, uh, school fees, philanthropy, every other thing you call philanthropy, and then because of that, you can attempt to compromise. And in some cases, Politicians have successfully compromised the votes of electorates using those uh, bags of rice, 500 naira, 200 naira, and all of those things. So that's the second point we want to establish. Politics of philanthropy. Votes are bought world over. But in third world countries, many of the voters and supporters are in such a place where you can compromise their votes with what they eat. In America, in Britain, you compromise people's votes by appealing to their intellect, so to speak, appealing to their ideology, appealing to their view, their worldview. For instance, in the UK, I've given examples with the US. Let's give another examples with the UK. On the issue of immigration, you will see that America is divided on the issue of immigration, for instance. And so you can be a pro open border kind of person and then you will get the votes of people who are open border kind of people. And then you could be, oh, let's lock them out. Let's deport all these immigrants. The immigrants are the cause of our problems in this country. Once you start doubling down on that, you will appeal to people who feel that immigrants are the problems. And then when you go to America and Britain, for instance, there are pro labor movements. Like you have a labor movement in Nigeria, people who are pro workers, they are, it's not a socialist bent, but they have a lot of socialist thing to their path, uh, to their you know uh, political package. You see that in that you see that the labor union and all of the political parties, you see some of them are pro this, pro that, for this, for that, and so once you come to any catchment area and you tell them what they like, then they will vote for you. In some places, that thing they like might be oh. He worships the same God as me. There are some people, what they like in the UK, they don't care. Sometimes they don't care about your ethnicity, but they want to know what your, your thing on gay marriage is. And so because of that, once you speak to that thing that they consider important, you will end their votes. But then in developing nations, because of Marshall's hierarchy of needs and where many of the voters are, they are in such a place or in such places where their votes can be compromised with things that they can eat, their votes can be compromised with health care needs, their votes can be compromised with you know all manner of things. And that is why you see politicians embark on all manner of quote unquote philanthropy. And this philanthropy now, there are three a lot of things it does. Let me start from the first. The first is that it takes the focus away from governance credentials. Now we have gotten to the substance of our discussion. This is where it gets a bit deeper. So now, if you ask a lot of voters, and they generally don't know, they think that someone will be good in government simply because he is a philanthropist. And this is not to say there are people who are naturally philanthropists and they do it because they genuinely care for the people. But that you have money and that you have the hearts to give it out does not mean that you might know one or two things about balancing uh, um, economic records. That you're a philanthropist, you might be a very brilliant businessman, you're a billionaire in US dollars. That does not mean that you can run the economies of nations. You might build hospitals, schools for your villages. You might be a subject matter expert. Maybe you made your money in oil and gas. You might be a subject matter expert in oil and gas. But that does not mean that you have the requisite skills to run a country or to run a state or to make meaningful contributions at the National Assembly. And so the voters don't know this. That's why each time they vote, they're asking the person who is coming out to contest, what have you done for the people? What have you done for... And by what have you done for the people, no matter what other contributions you have done, they don't value it if you have not given them notice to eat. They don't value it if you have not at least called 
30 people who you bought Kekena Peps for or 50 young people who you have bought uh, Okada for. So if you don't show them how many people you gave Okada, if you don't show them how many people you gave Keke, if you don't show them how many women you gave rap, Rapper or Bags of Rice, they don't consider you that you know anything about governance. And I'm telling you on this platform now, and you of course already know this, that sharing Keke, sharing Bags of Rice, giving women Rapper, giving people scholarships, buying sandals for school children, make sure that you are a good person but it does not automatically translate to actual governor's credentials having established this point let's then move to the next one now that we have established that yes you might be a big man quote unquote and you might be doing this because you love the people but that does not mean that if you go to the senate that you will know how to make good laws Yes, you're a rich man. You have been supporting widows in this community for decades. But that does not mean that if you go to the National Assembly that you know how to support the people. I'll give you an instance. Let's go back to Plateau State where things happened. The Christmas Eve killings in Plateau. And we're still mourning the Christmas Eve killings. Now, I may be a rich man. I may be a philanthropist. And... Anytime there's an attack on a community, I'll rush and give them bags of rice, you know, try to donate one million here to try to give them something. And at that humanitarian level, that brings them succor. But that bags of rice I supply may be the only thing I know about the conflict. And so when you tell this person now, yes, the bag of rice you are donating to the community is good. But anytime you donate bag of rice, it can only help people who survived the attack. The bags of rice will not help the people who were killed and it will not get them justice. You may have to, in addition to the bag of rice, begin to initiate the processes to get the federal government to proscribe armed Fulani headsmen as terrorists. And you can use the platform of a lawmaker to begin the lobbying process. You can, for instance, begin to make international overtures to lobbying groups, to international platforms. For instance, there are certain sections of the United States Constitution that you can bring under to declare what happened in Plateau as a foreign FTO, foreign terrorist organization. And what that does is that once that is done, you now have the U.S. government going after their funders. The people who are funding them, the bank freezing of their accounts, you know, trying to take this thing out from the top. But now, if you don't know the if you don't have the requisite skills to negotiate first with the federal government to declare them terrorists, to negotiate with the international organizations to declare them terrorists, and begin to inflict political, you know, because first you need to have that political coverage before you can now engage the military coverage. For instance, what the chief of defense, defense staff said yesterday, that it's not that the soldiers can't fight this, but there is a lot of political undertone, that there is a lot of political things that the politicians have to do. And I understand what he's saying correctly, because if the country does not see these people as terrorists, then the military will not see them as terrorists. Right. And so if military goes to bomb their camp, the people will now say, oh, they are bombing innocent pastoralists. So but the government, first of all, have to declare them a terrorist group, a terrorist organization, and then give the soldiers both the instructions and the legal tools they need to prosecute them. Right. And so that you shared bags of rice to widows or to communities who were attacked does not mean that you have all these other requisite skills to use the instruments of the law to pursue the criminals. And so, if the voters are not well trained, well trained, they will keep voting people who come and give them bag of rice each time they were attacked, and they will send them to the Senate, and they will send them to the National Assembly, and they will make them governors. But then this person, the only thing he can do for you anytime you are attacked is to cry on television and give you bags of rice. He has no solution to the problem, especially long-term solution. This is just one example to show you that philanthropy in itself does not equate to good governance. I'll give you another example. Let's say that you're a rich man, right? And that you are a benevolent guy in your village. And you are paying school fees and offering scholarship to 5,000 students, 500 students in your village. Every new academic session, you buy them books, exercise books, pay tuition, give them, you know, bursary allowances and all of those things. That is good. And you now, people now say, oh, you've been doing this wonderful work. Let's now make you, for instance, the Minister of Education. Or let's make you 
send you to the Senate or send you to the House of Representatives or send you to this place. That you are paying school fees does not mean that when they put you in charge of your education, that you can make informed policies on education. You might like education. You might want to give as many kids as possible the opportunities that you got. But that does not mean that you can design correct educational policies for the country or for the states or use the instrument of a legislator to affect their lives. Because people don't know this, but the goal of governance or government platforms is to use the instrument of governance to bring good governance at scale. Now that you're a philanthropist, you may be able to pay for 500 students their school fees. But if you write one education law, it can take care of all the stu students in the country. Just one policy on education. Now, you can be a senator and the only thing you know because you're a philanthropist is to go to, for instance, the Senate and you use your connections in the Senate to try to bring employment to your constituents. And your idea of bringing employment to your constituents is, oh, civil services, uh, immigration is imp uh, uh, recruiting. You go to the head of immigration and you smuggle in 10 people from your village into immigration. You hear that Nigerian army is recruiting. You go in there, you smuggle in seven names. You hear that, oh, the uh, Federal Bureau of Statistics is recruiting. You go in there, you smuggle in five people. At the end of the day, you may be able to get 500 of your villagers job and they are clapping for you and celebrating that, ah, this senator gave us federal jobs. But if this senator sits back and does his job, the senator can use the act of parliament and act of legislation to write laws and implement laws that will make jobs more available to more number of people. They can also use their oversight functions to insist that people who are responsible for managing the economy goes ahead to manage it well so that more people can be employed, so that even the SMEs can, for instance, the lawmaker now can come back to the village and brag, I gave 72 people from this community federal jobs. That's a key achievement, quote unquote. But then the lawmaker can also come back and say, we have written a law, for instance, what is that law? Um, Nigeria's innovation law, for instance that empowered SMEs. We have written this law and this law has made it easier for people to thrive in the SME sector and because of this law, more young people are going into entrepreneurship and these more young people going into entrepreneurship are now employing people. So this one law that this senator wrote and fought hard to see that it was passed into law, if implemented, can create 3 million jobs. But that senator that had the opportunity to create 3 million jobs is celebrating in his village that he gave 72 people jobs. Developing countries and the politics of philanthropy. And so you see now why your lawmakers are focused on, I attracted this, I attracted that, and we are not dis disputing with them that they attracted. But then if you ask yourself, what is the job of a lawmaker? Is it to build covers? Is it to build bridges? Is it to tie roads? Is it to put up electricity? For instance, in the current budget, I think the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and something, something, putting about 200 billion in Senate President's uh, constituency to, I think, the tarring roads or something, what 300, I think there, there was something I, I saw online, you know, I didn't study it carefully, so I'm not going to make categorical statement because I just saw it on the fly and I didn't bother to confirm it. But then, so you find that you have a system in this politics of philanthropy where your lawmakers have left the job of making laws and they are now in, I bought bags of rice, I empowered people with keke, I gave them sewing machine, I gave them frying pan. So this Christmas was a good opportunity for us to see politics of philanthropy in full display. This senator had the opportunity to make laws that will impact our lives. But because we don't judge them by the laws they make, we judge them by how many keke did you share while you were in the National Assembly. So they will leave the job of lawmaking aside and focus on trying to create, quote unquote, empowerment schemes. When they buy 300 laptops, it's empowerment scheme. And we're not disputing that. But we're saying that the job of the executive is clearly delineated. 
The job of the judiciary is clearly stated. The job of the lawmaker is clearly stated. And in an atmosphere where you have that everybody is judging performance based on quote-unquote philanthropic gestures, that you now find people who imagine one day that judges, Supreme Court judges, come back to the village. I'm just giving you an instance. And instead of reading credible judgments on the election petition tribunal, they came back to their village and shared uh, Kekena Pepper to 1,000 youths. Imagine the Supreme Court justice. Instead of pronouncing... So that one judicial pronouncement you make as a Supreme Court judge is much more than what you can do by sharing 1,000 KK. So I want you to close your eyes for a minute and imagine that we sent someone to Supreme Court to go and take judicial decisions. The question was whether there was 25% or not in Abuja, whether this person was lawfully declared, whether this... And instead of making judicial pronouncements, they will leave the judicial pronouncement that they are supposed to make and then come back to the village and start sharing a kind of pep. And we are clapping for them. That's what we are doing with our lawmakers. And I'm not speaking on them today, but I'm just making a point. And then after this point, I'll move on to the next point. That you see that the job of a lawmaker is to make laws and through, so the best empowerment a lawmaker can give is to empower people through the laws they make. I'll give you an instance. I have been working on the census for some time now. I don't know for how long, I think from October 2022. And if you see, as a, although we have made substantial progress, which we have not, you know, it's not in our nature to announce some of these things to the public except when they need to know. But in our engaging with several stakeholders who could help. And we found out that the laws governing the census exercise was written as far back as the 70s. And these laws are outrightly outdated. Again, again I'll give you an instance. I can come back to my village as a minister for whatever, and I can choose to give 300 people scholarship. Or we can insist that the education curricula of Nigeria is outdated. We can sit down and design new and updated education curricula that is not just interested in giving people regurgitated theories, but giving them both theory practical and then training them on 21st century in-demand skills. If we sit down as an education policy and design a new education policy for the country, you would have created more jobs, you would have created more opportunities, you would have empowered more people than say that you picked 1,000 random people from your village and then you say, oh, I've empowered them by giving them school fees for one year. But now, how do we select these leaders? We select these leaders because of quote-unquote empowerment. Hey, they are empowerment, this guy. If someone is running for governor and he's telling us he has manifesto, he has economic policies, and people can tell you, go and sit down. Has he built the road in his father's house? And you say, if I build the road in my father's house, how does that automatically translate to governance experience? It might show that I'm a good person. It might show that I have the willingness to do, but it does not show that I have the competence and the capacity because we have seen several philanthropists who go on, for instance, Rocha Sokorocha was a good philanthropist, a good one. It is still, today people don't know that that guy, you can't find, if you call the type, maybe in those days, top 10 philanthropists, especially in education, that is Rocha's foundation was very big and heavy on education. And people say, oh, this guy was good. I remember how people celebrated when Rocha Sokorocha won his governorship election. But I've foreseen that, that your paying school fees doesn't... Okay, now, you now ask yourself. Yes, Rocha Sokorocha was big on education, quote-unquote. But he was the governor of a state for eight years. Go and look at his education policies. This is a philanthropist who was big on education. So the point, and we can find a lot of examples. You can find people who have gone into government because they shared keke, because they gave out bags of rice, and they got into government, and you now want to see their policies. And you now ask yourself, look, if we send people whose only credential is that they share keke and pep, if they go into office, don't expect them to perform miracles. The only thing they can bring back is keke and pep. That's it. If you send a senator, 
to the National Assembly. And why you sent him to the National Assembly is because they, he bought you rapper. If he comes back, he cannot bring you laws. He will only bring back rapper. If we send people because they gave us Indomie, if we make them presidents, they will not do well on the economic policy. But you see Indomie, he will give us Indomie. And so you now have in your National Assembly bands and tens, if not hundreds, of Indomie sharers. You go and see, you ask yourself, I, 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 I pity Nigeria, really. If you go and see the people you call the, your lawmakers, if you sit down with them and ask them, what is your legislative agenda? Nothing. It's just let me help my people the best way I can. So how are you helping your people? I don't know. So what he's looking for is running around, looking for budgets so that he can insert train of 50 Okada, you know, train of 50 youths on how to ride Okada and then buy them Okada, train of 500 women on how to sew. And all of those things are good. I am not disputing that. And when you are in a third world country, you need them. But then this lawmaker is functioning at less than 5% of his installed capacity because through one law, he can make the situation better for everybody. Or at least for the most people. But you sit in an office where you can use laws. Because in all of those places, in America, in Britain, in all of these places, in Canada, where our young people are running to, because, quote-unquote, they have better opportunities there. The opportunities there as a result of intentional public policy design. And so you have an opportunity for four years or eight years to intentionally design better public policies. Then you throw away that opportunity because you are trying to, quote unquote, buy kekena pepe for 100 people in your village. That's more mindedness. And actually, when people who can use public policy tools to elevate the plight of the people come, they will ask you, ah, ah, did you buy keke? The other man was sharing fridge. The other, I know of one person, each election year, he will go to radio station, buy airtime. He's doing airtime. He's sharing airtime. 5,000. He will just call. If you call, he will ask you one funny question that everybody knows the answer. He will just be dashing out airtime, motorcycle, fridge, iron. That's how he wins his election. That's how he wins his election. Every time he is just sharing this thesis. And when he goes to the National Assembly and you want to see, okay, what are the laws he's implementing? What are the public policy goals? Nothing. He's just waiting to share bags of rice again. And each time they share these bags of rice, of course, they will make sure that Arise TV, Channel TV, and all of these people are there to capture the, because they want to, quote unquote, prove that they are philanthropists. They want to, quote unquote, prove that they are not only doing something for the masses, but they are visibly showing that they are doing something for the masses. Politics of philanthropy. I'll make three more points and then we'll call it a day, or maybe two more points. Remember that this platform is Boker School of Government, where we teach biblical principles to sound governance situation. One of the disadvantages of the system we now run, the philanthropy-based system, is that we send people whose only credential is that they are philanthropists. And when they go there, they will reduce a very big office. They will achieve so little with so much opportunity because they are not prepared and the only thing they can see or they know how to do is politics of philanthropy. If we send in people who can write good education laws, they may not pay school fees for 100 villagers, but that education law they wrote is all the villagers need. If you send people who know economic policies, they may not be able to share 100,000 naira trader money or you win or whatever. But through their economic policies, they can empower a whole nation. For instance, someone can distribute 10,000 10, naira trader money and then they will use the economic policies to take away the money from you. Someone who has shared trader money and increased the minimum wage from 18,000 naira to 30,000 naira, but he went to the CBN and printed currency. What? He has already used inflation to take away the money from you. Anybody who had money in their account four months ago, five months ago, knows that the money you had in your account four months ago and the money in your account today, they are not the same value. And so someone can come to the village and give them 10,000 10, naira each and they are shouting, oh God, they talk. 
and that person can use economic policies or the failure to design better economic policies and take away those things from them. And so you see that in this politics of philanthropy that the nation loses, even the person who received keke is losing because you could have gotten much more than that. Even if you received 10 keke in one go, you lost because you could have gotten much more than that. Because that keke that you got down, you don't have... Look at how much can you buy fuel. And okay, even if you have struggled to buy fuel, to apply that, the keke is flying on a very terrible road. Okay, even if you manage to buy fuel and buy the road, by the time you say, okay, let me save money in my Naira account, by the time you have saved up to a million, one economic policy will move that one million from today. One million is one thousand dollars. One million is one just one thousand dollars is one million. So if you struggle or everything you struggle this year to make one million, you have only had one thousand dollars. Whereas three, four years ago, it was much more than that. And so yes, you now have keke, but the economy you don't have it. Yes, you now have bags of rice, but the economy you don't have it. So the politics of philanthropy first elevates people who will always find a way to reduce themselves and the impact of the offices they occupy. Because instead of using these policy tools of the offices they occupy to bring good, what they are focused on is to try to bring quote unquote goodies for, for their villagers or for their members or for their constituents or for their kinsmen. That's one. Two, it makes it nearly impossible for people who have credible ideas. For instance, I know Godson, who is on this platform, and I've seen the kind of programs he has been attending, the kind of things he has been doing. And in two or three or four, five years' time, because of the volume of trainings, work that he's been doing, he can qualify to be a lawmaker. And you are sure that he will use the instruments of a lawmaker well, because you know the kind of laws he's going to make. But if this kind of person wants to run now, someone who has bags of rice to share will come and push him aside, and then he will still go back and be learning what he's learning. And then these people are eating rice. Every four years, you are eating bags of rice. And this person that you have sent to the National Assembly might be a good person, but if you don't know governance, you don't know governance. And how many people can afford to go to a hospital and they, they, they send themselves to, for instance, a medical doctor? And this medical doctor is a, is a very kind-hearted medical doctor, but he doesn't know what he's doing. He's a very kind-hearted man, but he has not gone to any school of medicine. People will not be able to entrust them with their lives. But then we are entrusting the economy, we are entrusting the governance system into the lives of people or hands of people who don't have the technical know-how to manage it simply because they spoke our language, they gave us what we wanted to, to hear. They gave us food, they gave us care, they gave us bicycles, they gave us this and they spoke the language uh, that we would love to hear. And so let's switch now to the final segment of the program. The Bible says, if I give myself to be born, but I do not do it in love. Already you've seen the Bible is coming to talk about your politicians. Because we see some politicians. Because for Christians, the Bible says, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing. And it does. It means if you give someone arms, don't go around publicizing it. But in this atmosphere of politics of philanthropy, you are duty bound not only to empower people, but to make sure that Channels TV, Arise TV, and your social media audience are there when you are empowering the people. And that does two things. One, it disempowers the people you are empowering. If you looked at the life of Jesus Christ, anytime he does good for people, you tell them, don't communicate it, don't bother yourself, don't tell people, go show yourself to the high priest, don't bother, don't bother. But it is them out of excitement that will go and tell what this man did for him. And anytime someone does something for you and you rejoice and out of excitement go telling people, this is what this lawmaker did for me. You are saying it in a way that gives them the accolade but also preserves your dignity. But if I give you 5,000 today and I bring in cameras to show where I'm giving you 5,000. I have given you the money, but it robs you of your dignity because the way it is going to be reported, it's not in a way that would dignify you. It will, dignify, it will show you as someone who is in need of 5,000. Now, if you give me 5,000 today, I can say thank you. I can also decide to 
go around telling people that you give but then i retain the agency to choose how to publicize it but then in this mode of philanthropic politics or politics of philanthropy you have taken away the agency from the people that you now give them bags of rice and in ways you see there are videos i saw online and I, it just disorients me where you bring in women and you give them money and they are shouting and dancing and singing and these are people's mothers and i'm asking this person making this video if it is your mother if it is your mother, will you allow someone to be filming your mother doing this kind of thing for 2,000 Naira? If it is your own mother that gives birth to you, will you allow someone else to be filming this person because you gave him 5,000 or gave her 5,000? And you are filming it and your media warriors are putting it everywhere to show people that, hey, you are a philanthropist. No, you are not a philanthropist. You are just exploiting people's vulnerability for your political advantage. And so this is now the system that anybody must shoot. Not only will you love the people, not only will you give to, but you must prove that you give. And that is why even good people, and this policy of philanthropy has gotten even to the best of us. Look at P2B. Anytime he goes to donate um, 20 million to schools here, 20 million to hospitals here, 20. He is forced to go there with camera and crew. He is forced to because he, you live in a politics that asks you, what have you done for the masses? This man could have easily wrote his check quietly and give the, the school. He could have wrote his check quietly and give to the hospital. He could have wrote his check quietly and give to anybody. But now, an arrest CV must be there. His media aids must be there. That is why you see him in you, all of the... Now we know that he donated to 10 million to, to the people in, in Plaza. He could have as well made that donation without us knowing. Even while he was there to condole them, he condoles them and finishes. And at the end of the day, the people who need the money knows that they... And the people, he looks for the people and gives them the money. In the glare of all the beneficiaries, but not the glare of camera. But you see, in this atmosphere of policies of philanthropy, not only will you be a philanthropist, but you must visibly demonstrate yourself to be so much so. And in so doing, you disempower the people and, you know, uh, take away the agency, in some cases, the dignity of the same people that you're doing it for. In our own case, the Bible says that you have gotten your reward. And once you call Arise TV to come and cover where you're giving people to 20 million, you have gotten your reward. Because, of course, people will clap for you. People will say, oh, this is a very good man. People will say, wow, I'm voting because of this 20 million. And yes, people can vote you because of that. But in our case, you have gotten your reward. That's according to Bible standard. And for those of us who are students of this Booker School of Government, we have to apply ourselves differently. We have to apply ourselves differently. And let me say something, because you have this reporting obligation also in this politics of philanthropy, especially for people who are running maybe not for profits. And sometimes we report out of ego. Like when you see someone who came on Twitter and he says, oh no, I want to raise money for my primary school library. We want to fund our prime. And then every day they're giving you, we bought chewing stick, we bought chewing gum, five naira. Look, all of those things is good to be accountable. But just know that some of the things you call accountability are driven by ego. Needless ego. Because sometimes we report off out of our ego. Not necessarily we were prompted to give account. But because we want to appear before men as righteous. And so that wanting to appear before men as righteous, as a very honest person, is why you are doing everything. You are going to bring camera to show. So if you buy pampas for the women, you want to carry the women and show the, the women and the pampas. In fact, if it is possible, you have asked them to, 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 to show their clothes so that they will display where they are wearing the pampas so that you will prove that they have bought the pampas. Look, no. Some of the reporting obligations go out of the line. And then in some reporting obligations, you don't have to report them publicly. If you have received funding support from 20 individuals, go and report to the 20 individuals. You don't have to prove to Twitter that you are a nice man, especially when they are not the old primary audience that gave you the resources. And then even when you are funding, you are reporting to the funders. I'm not saying don't be transparent, but just know that some things we call transparency can be driven out of ego or out of that impulsive desire to appear before men as righteous. 
Because this loss for people to understand you, for people to see you as a nice person, as an accountable person, can push you into the process of trying to prove and show all workings. And in some cases where you are showing all workings, you are inadvertently disempowering the people you are meant to empower. The other thing about policies of philanthropy, I think this is the last thing, is that bad people can have good hearts. And I know that this is quite oxymoronic, but let me labor a minute to prove it. Bad people can have, quote unquote, a good heart. And you may have to refer to one of our classes on the heart of public servants to understand this. But let me paint a picture. And this, what I'm telling you, is a true life story. I know of people in this Nigeria, they are still alive. President Goodluck Jonathan gave them turn around maintenance of refineries. Turn around maintenance of refineries. And these guys took all the money and did not maintain any refinery. And because of that, yes, you will blame the Goodluck Jonathan for paying them up front. You also blame is because he was an alleged, he was just a less affair kind of person. There were a lot of corruption in his government. That is a given. But this same person comes back to his village and his community and he's sharing bags of rice and he's doing free medical outreach. But they gave you turnaround maintenance of refinery that if our refineries are working and you have been paid for this, those villagers will be buying fuel at the appropriate amount. And if fuel is sold at the appropriate amount, need I tell people here what it will do to the economy, including the economies of those villagers. But now you go to the nation and steal the refinery, and steal the collective future of everybody because you have access to politicians and because you're a political gladiator yourself. And then you now come back to the village. And if people come to your house, hey, my son is sick, 200,000. Hey, my son is this, 1 million. Hey, hey, hey. Well, anything, you know, the additional money. But at that holistic level, the damage that they have done, the damage that they have done, and this is why you see politicians can give you, but they will steal you blind. They are good people. They can give to their communities, they can donate to churches, they can donate to mosques, but at the slightest opportunity, they will steal blind. And when they are finished stealing, if they hear you crying, from that their stolen treasure, they will give you. From that one they stole. Haven't you heard in those days of arm robbery, those famous arm robbers, those days arm robbers were famous, they will finish robbing a bank, and even in the bank, they will kill someone in the bank, inside the bank. As they are robbing the bank, the security man you killed has wife, has children. The banker you killed has wife, has children. The people that will lose their jobs as a result of you, they have families. But then you finish stealing from the bank and you come to the market square and you spray a few thousand naira, spray, 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 and you go home. And so, what kind of philanthropist is this that will steal to give? That's, it's confusing if you think of it. And I can tell you for free, we have seen this time and time again in Nigeria. That you have your quote-unquote philanthropists who are quote-unquote nice people. And they do something nice for people. They damage the people at the macro level and then come at the micro level to help the same people. So this man that has stolen the entire refinery for the whole of the nation, at least if he had done the turnaround maintenance on the two refineries he had been paid for, Nigeria will enjoy some semblance of you know, peace as it regards uh, prices of petrochemicals and petroleum products. But this person has stolen it. But then when he comes back to the same community of villagers who he went up and stay stole from, he will now be giving them peanuts and we are clapping for them. And then during the election, we will now ask him, Oga, who should we vote for? And he will now tell us because he is now the political uh, jagaban who is telling people what they should, uh, uh, how they should vote. And because of his quote-unquote philanthropy, this criminal 
is now the person determining who goes to the Senate, who goes to the National Assembly, who goes to the House of Assembly, who goes to this. And this is what you have when you have a, an atmosphere of politics, of philanthropy. There are one or two points I'll make now, but I would love for you to ask your questions so that in answering those questions, I can you know, smuggle in the points before we call it a day. Yes. Akin, I'm not sure I'm getting your name correctly, but just please go ahead and make your contribution, Akin. So, yeah, I mean, I've listened to, first I, I first listened to your interview on, on Arise. That was when I started to, to follow you, and then I've listened to this podcast. I think it's also interesting. We elect leaders to something that a lot of people even the elite, even the elite, the educated, still need to, needs to know because oftentimes we are blinded by the by the ideology of uh, of religion, of ethnic groups, and of and of of quote unquote what people do, what people do to cover up. So in a way, it's not like the developed world where ideologies matters. A lot, just like uh, the present um, president of Argentina, which we are kind of trying to see how his ideology would leave the country, if it would or not. But then I just saw uh, a post about the worst performing currencies in the world as of 2023, and then Naira happened to be like bottom third and it's and it, and it comes down to the issue of policies of putting in the right people that will that will make that will put in the right people with the, with the right brains that will change some certain policies some policies that have been there since 1960 the old policies that have been there since the 60s and 70s implement new ones and see how the whole economy moves moves forward. So but unfortunately we are, we found ourselves in this position and the whole issue of election and appointments are based on who is closer to the who is closer to the, the, the person in power. And and then, and then if it's not taken we will continue to go down the drain. And then uh, based on the issue of philanthropies, as you were, because I'm an architect and, and that is something that we are I'm working on currently on my on my on my thesis, my PhD thesis. So it's about enabling people of the lower income or the middle income to acquire their their homes based on their income capabilities okay and and i'm going against the 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 norm of the society whereby it's only the the super rich or the rich that is able to to buy houses so it's something, something that we are working on, particularly for Africa. But then these are things that could, cannot be easily implemented if there are no government support, not, not necessarily giving them bags of rice, giving them garlic oil, but enabling them to acquire their own houses, even from their monthly income. So that they they live free of rent, of 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 paying rent, because in some cases people pay more than thirty percent of their monthly income to rent and bills. So if so if if, if there are enabling policies with with uh, with enough research, certain so that can be implemented. And this is, this is something that I'm going to uh, working on. And perhaps in the future, something that I would maybe equally share with you. But then 
I just want to appreciate the, the podcast, I mean, the, all what you said, and I hope that things like this would get more listening, have more, more people listening. But at the end of the day, no matter how, how you hustle, how you work hard, if there are no good policies, your 1,000 Naira is still, sorry, your 1 million Naira is still 1,000 US dollars. And it can, it cannot, even in, US, even in the US, you cannot survive with, with 1,000 1, US dollars for more than, for, for even in, okay, in Europe, you can't can survive, because I, 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 I live in Europe, you can't survive with more than 1 million for more than two months in, in some countries. So that, that, that is how bad it is. So no, so no matter how how hard you, somebody hustles in Nigeria or something like that, if you equate it to the Naira, it's still very low. So until you begin to hold these people responsible for better policies, it will continue to draw us back. But it's so that people are not working hard. They're working hard, but then it, if compared to the standard, which is the US dollar, it's, it, you are, people are still poor, like miserably poor. So I hope things like this gets out in the air and people listen to this and maybe perhaps that could change, that could begin to change a level of mindset and mentality. Thank you. Thank you so much, my dear brother. It's quite appreciated, your contributions, and I think you had a way of even driving it further. Because look, if the policies that you're researching now uh, are implemented, it gives the worker, it gives the person, you don't have to be a millionaire, a multi-millionaire, a billionaire to own a house. But if these policies are implemented, that money you spend on house rents, you could now cut it back and spend it on something else. But then this person does not think about it. He wants bag of rice. He wants, you know, tomatoes. He wants something. And, or they can say, oh, we worship at the same church. And that's, I think that there is something you said uh, you didn't call it exactly that, but it's what it is, politics of proximity. And people don't know that policies of proximity uh, can hurt you. Uh, for instance, um, the president can be attending your church, but that does not mean that you buy fuel <laughs> at a different price. The, 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 the president can be your kingsman, but that does not mean that you are insulated from economic policies. As a matter of fact, the president can give you a job, and you are that job any three hundred thousand naira. And his economic policies, at the end of his eight years in office, you are still any three hundred thousand naira federal government job. But you will find out that you were better off under the previous economic regime when you were not earning as much, because now your hundred thousand naira means less of international has less value than say. Someone who was making 18,000 naira when they were paying 18,000 naira minimum wage is far richer than the person who is earning 30,000 naira under this new economic regime. It's far richer. You could buy more things, you could afford more things with 18,000 naira then compared to what, what, what you can get with 30,000 naira now. So people don't understand that politics of proximity. Another instance is President Buhari is from Castina. In fact, Castina State alone, Castina produced Buhari for two times, Castina produced Omar Yaradua, Castina produced the Northwest as a geopolitical zone, has produced far more presidents than any other zone in Nigeria. In fact, if you combine other regions, other zones in Nigeria, I think they will now be at par with how many presidents you have produced from the Northwest alone. I bet then go to the mixed survey of 2022 that was released, I think, last year. You will see that the Northwest is worse off in almost all indices of measurements. Are you talking about literacy rates, mortality rates, maternal mortality, infant mortality, or are you going to be talking about insecurity? Insecurity is ravaging more, even in Castina, that people have to pay to sleep in their villages. And this is the place where the president is from. And so politics of proximity, because people have this on the idea that if it is our man, it, like uh, in my home state, I hear some people arguing blindly that someone from my own town should become the governor. And if he's from governor, at least he will look. 
that someone is from your town and he's from he's a governor does not give him governance credentials. If he's a terrible person, he's a terrible person. I know a lot of um, people who supported President Bola Metunubu simply because of where he hails from. Today they are cursing him to the high heavens. Because that someone looks like you, wears your kind of clothes, worships your kind of God, goes to your kind of church, you know, does not mean that once he enters that things will be good for you. But people don't rationally think about these issues before making voting decisions. And it's usually after they have voted that they will now come on Twitter or any other place to come and lament, oh, had I known I wouldn't have, but you have voted and you have put all of us in trouble. So that is why before the 2027 election or another window of opportunity opens, we are here at Boca School of Government and other platforms available to us to begin to conscientize people, to tell them, look, you might become the governor's PA, but that does not mean that your life has improved. If you, the governor can be coming to your church, the best thing that can happen to you is that Sairi is now back in your church, but it does not help you. In fact, as a matter of fact, you know, there was in this in, in, in the city where I was. So there was this lockdown one Friday. And I was like, ah, what's the problem? They said that the vice president went to pray in a particular mosque. Mm -hmm. This is not his usual mosque where he prays. And because the vice president went to pray, they cut off, they cut off every people were staying in traffic. And there was no prayer announcement, and there was nothing. People were just trying to find out what was going on. And because it was a it was a terrible situation. So now, if I voted for this vice president because he worships at my mosque, the only thing I can benefit from him is that the day he will choose to come to that mosque, I will not have access to the road. That is the only benefit I will get. That's it. Apart from the motive, oh, he's a fellow Christian, he's a fellow Muslim, he's a fellow Yoruba, he's a fellow Yoruba, nothing. And so we'll have to take our time to start telling people that politics of proximity, politics of identity, politics of philanthropy has, even if it achieves any results, it will be very, very minimal. So thank you so much, my dear brother, for making that contribution. Finally, before we draw the question on this episode, last thing I want to say is that Politics of philanthropy cannot thrive where you don't have rabid individualism. Politics of philanthropy cannot thrive where you don't have rabid individualism or what I can call hyper selfishness. When people are interested in themselves, 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 then politicians can exploit that self interest. To their own advantage and then to your utter disadvantage because after i've been trying out these experiments now it's not ex an experiment that i intentionally want to try out but anytime it happens i take my time to think about it when i was working on a political campaign my principal was giving a speech somewhere and in the middle of his political speech, because people had waited for us for far too longer than we had scheduled, we went late to the event. So while he was speaking, we knew that the hall was not air conditioned. So we beckoned on them to start sharing water to the people, at least that people can at least have refreshments while the political guy is delivering his political speech or his statement. And one thing happened that was quite you know, fascinating to me because I was sitting in the front and, you know, bottles are in packs, the packs of 12. So this guy had come, there were packs of bottles, of course, outside. And so he had come, he had shared the first pack, he had gotten to the second pack of the 12. And then in the last bottle in the 12, I now saw these two guys struggling over water, two guys struggling. They were just struggling over, they just wanted to grab the water. And I was watching. And the, the thing was distracting to the guy, but he wanted to stay focused on his speech. He looked at them and removed his eyes, but so I focused on them to know what was going on. Eventually, one of them grabbed that last bottle, not the last bottle that was there, but the last bottle in that particular pack, and the guy was still going outside to get another pack. And I was, okay, maybe this guy was struggling over water because he was so thirsty. Maybe because he was so thirsty. And you know, I was observing the guy all through that. We finished that whole event. The guy did not open that water. But when he got that water, he felt so much accomplished. Yes, I've gotten it. And he now kept it close to his side. So you were distracting everybody, fighting over a water that you will not drink. And 
entitlement. The second point is that still in that same campaign, you know, we were interns and volunteers. This was years ago. But then you had these directors of campaign organizations, former days, former dads, they come into vehicles with their SUVs. So then every evening after we had gone to the political campaign, because it's not a salaried appointment, you are just interning for a politician. So in the evening, when we come back from campaign rallies to the campaign office, where the boss will drop everybody, they, they are sharing this. Sometimes the candidates can decide to share 3,000 naira, the candidate can decide to share 5,000 naira, you know, depending on how much cash he has and how many people are there. So he can decide to bring out maybe 300,000 and decide to share to the people there. And then depending on the number of people who will share it. And this man that packs SUV, you will see his bigger. If you see where he's fighting and struggling for 3,000 naira, brother, even me that didn't have a stable job then will not fight for 3,000. But this man, former this, former that, a director in the campaign organization, is struggling. And you ask yourself, can this money feed this guy? No. Can this money fill his car? No. Can this money, what we need, but this entitlement, this greed, is actually greed. And so politicians have found a way to exploit our greed. I'll give you another example. I was at the National Assembly a couple of days ago, yeah? And I was meeting with, you know, House Committee Chairperson on this, House Committee Chairperson on that, to, you know, bring light to some of the public policy advocacy work we've been working on to try to make our case. In fact, I was there because I wanted to stop a government organization from receiving funding from this budget. But then they received the budget, the funding, and then there were promises that were made that the oversight would be better. You know, all of so. But, well, the bottom line is this. I was in this office waiting for this lawmaker. So they had just finished plenary. He told me, come before our plenary so that once we finish. So I came. I was in his office. They finished plenary. And people were just there in his office waiting for him. The people he gave appointment the same way. And every one of them, they were carrying brown envelopes. This person wanted a job at the Navy. This person wanted a job at the Air Force. This person wanted this. This person wanted that. This, everybody came for their self. Me, myself. What can I get from this lawmaker? What can I get? What can I get? What can I get? And this is not to praise myself, but it occurred to me that I was the only person there who came for public policy. Because the committee that this person is the chairperson of the committee on me, this committee can use the powers available to this community to impact public policy. And I was here pushing public policy, but the other people are interested in government contracts. I want a job. I want this. I want that. So when you have place or a society where the people, even when they have begun to get lifted in life, because yes, for market women who don't have anything to eat, you can say, okay, beautiful. But you will see rich men. You will see their rings. You will see the kind of clothing they wear. But everything they are coming to get from the senator is contracts. And so in that atmosphere of atmosphere rather of trying to grab all you can and can all you grabbed, the politician can use a unique greed to exploit us, promise this person contracts, promise the other person. Of course, they don't have capacity to fulfill all of them, but they can try, right? And then using that greed. So politics of philanthropy or politics of exploitation does not thrive when people are going for collective good. And so you see again what happens in the house of the senator when he comes home for Christmas or for New Year or when he comes home for weekend. People trunk his house. And instead of telling him, Oga, come, let us fix the primary health care in our village, they are asking him, give me money to take my son to private hospital. Instead of saying, how can we fix the public school in our village so that more children can go to school? They are asking him, come and pay my son's school fees in a private secondary school. Instead of saying, how can we make it better for us? The thing is, how can I make it better for me? And so when you have that many of the requests that your lawmakers get, many of the requests that your governors get, many of the requests that your politically exposed persons get are me, 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 myself, and I. In that atmosphere, then they will, of course, abandon collective good to start pursuing private good. And the private good can be delivered to only people who have access to them. And even with the people who have access to them, their capacity to respond is limited. That's why if they have 100 OES members, only 10 or 15 will get quote-unquote empowerment from them. The others will be giving hope, hope, hope. Maybe when I win the next election. Maybe when I win the next election. But look, they don't have the capacity. But then if we can amend our requests, 
when we meet lawmakers, when we meet governors, if we can amend our request, instead of asking for my son's school fees, I can now ask, can you fix the primary health care, the, the, the secondary school or the primary school? Instead of asking, oh, this thing happened to me, I want to go abroad, I can say, can't you fix the economy? But no, you don't want to fix the economy, you want him to give you money to make your visa. You see the problem now? How many people within his legitimate income and even with his stolen money can he process visas for as again sitting down to write public policies? So Nigeria is also the way it is because you have people who are available to be exploited. It is our greed that the politicians choose to exploit. Not that we don't know that some of them are criminals. We know that some of these people are criminals, but anytime they give us what we want, we now overlook their criminality and vote them or keep supporting them, hoping that a criminal will turn out to produce a good society. No, a criminal leader who you have made a senator is still a criminal just now that he is a senator criminal. A criminal that you made a president is still a criminal just as he's now a criminal president. A criminal that you made a governor is still a criminal just that now he has more opportunity to practice his criminality. So public office cannot change anybody. Public office will only amplify what he sees in the person. This is the end of our edition of Poker School of Government. I thank each and every one of us for participating and I look forward to having more small. Please, if you can, follow at Boker School, um, at Boker School, A B O Q E R, then school on Twitter, on, on other social media platforms. And then if you also can, go through my timeline and see if you can join our WhatsApp group where we have more robust engagements uh, on the WhatsApp group. I look forward to seeing us next Tuesday by 9 p.m. Nigeria, and then we'll discuss much more interesting topics and uh, circulating around the issues we are discussing, political, governance, governmental issues. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Chima Christian. Africa's morning is at hand.